Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. I want today to speak to us for a while on the topic, the double burden bearer. Amen. The double burden bearer. Would you bow your heads with me one more moment? Father, once again, God, we humble ourselves in your presence and we take time to recognize, God, that there is no more important function in the meeting of God's people, in the coming together of the saints, there is no greater importance that can be placed on any part of this gathering today than the Word of God going forth. And Lord, I will never understand in as long as many years as you may give me on this earth, I will never understand why you chose me, why you called me to bring the word of God to people's hearing. But Lord, today I acknowledge humbly in your presence that without the anointing, I am nothing. Without the anointing, I have no capability, no power, no uh, talent, nothing, God, that would help me to bring a word to the people of God that might be of help to them. I need that anointing, Lord, that same anointing I needed 35 years ago when I started this journey in ministry. I need that same anointing even today. Touch my heart, my body, my lips of clay. Allow me, God, today to deliver what you have given me for your people. Allow your people to be of a mind and a heart to receive today the engrafted word of God. That it not merely be a flesh in their hearing, but Lord, that it be a word that becomes a very part of their soul and their substance. Helping them, God, to live godly, holy lives. Lord, that are not only pleasing to you, but are a testimony to an unsaved world. Increase our faith this hour. For we ask it in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated today. I'm going to try real hard to keep this relatively brief. Oh, you just had to go there, Johnny. You just, he just had to chuckle. So people on Facebook and people on the video can hear him chuckle. I'm going to try. I'm looking at the clock. Let me see if I can remember what time I started. That's my biggest problem. I forget what time I started by the time I'm done. Amen. There are two kinds of people in the world. And it's not Christian and, non and, and non-Christian. No, no, those aren't the two kinds of people. There are believers and unbelievers. You see, there are people who are not Christians, but they believe in God. They believe that a God exists. And I will not, for one, I will not take away from anybody any faith that they have, even if their faith is misguided, even if their faith is misdirected. I'm not saying, folks, do not misunderstand me. I'm not giving anybody a ticket to heaven that does not believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have the power to do that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, this preacher, just ignorant and stupid enough to believe that if he said it, he meant it, and that he is indeed today the only singular way to God. Amen. Now, what God is going to do with the Hindu and the Buddhist and all of those others, that's his business. I, I'm not going to sit in judgment because who am I? To make any judgment. God knows what he's doing. I really believe it's funny when human beings try to understand God within a human context. It always cracks me up when I see people write things online or when I see videos on YouTube. And people are trying to explain God within a human context. And I think to myself, you know... When all this thing winds up and God reveals to us exactly how everything worked 
and how everything came together and how everything functioned, I think there's going to be a lot of embarrassed people. Because they're going to be sitting there saying, oh boy, who boy did I miss that. I See, I never thought about that. I never realized that. I never gave it a thought. I never thought about entire nations. The Word of God said in the book of Revelation that Satan is the deceiver of the nations. He's not able to just deceive an individual, but he's able to deceive nations. Of people. Well, are you telling me entire nations of people who, who believe this way are going to be lost? Um, yeah, sadly. But you know why? Because too many people think about the fact that your choice today affects generations tomorrow. Hello now. Your choice today affects generations to come. S somewhere in the history of that nation... Somebody had an opportunity to turn to Christ, but chose not to. And it has then rippled down through the generations. You hear what I'm telling you now? You see, we always look at things in these little tiny glasses. We always look at things through these little tiny spectacles. Oh, well, if God is a God of love, how can anybody be lost? If God is a God of love, how can anybody wind up in hell? Well, first of all, I'm not going to go into my personal conviction concerning hell. I don't believe hell is what traditionally has been represented of hell. I believe it's hell. I believe you're outside of the presence of God. I believe you are eternally separated from God. And honey, I don't care if it's Club Med, that is a punishment. You are not only separated from God, but you are separated from everyone in your family, all of your friends who are connected to God by the Spirit. Amen. So I love my great grandma. I'm going to tell you, my grandma was connected to Jesus, and I have every intention of being connected to great grandma and Jesus when I die. Hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I don't want to wind up somewhere where not only am I out of the presence of the Lord, but I never see great grandma again. I'm going to tell you, my great-grandmother loved the Holy Ghost. She loved the presence of God. She loved that king we call Jesus. She loved his nail-scarred hands. She loved the blood he shed on the cross of Calvary. She loved the cross, honey. She loved the empty tomb. She loved the dove that flew down when he was baptized. Glory to God. She loved the fire that fell on the day of Pentecost. She loved everything had to do with God. So if anybody's going to be with God, Grandma's going to be there. And I plan on being there too. Amen. Amen. But there are two kinds of people in the world. There's believers and unbelievers. So the Word of God said, if we would come to God, we must first believe that God is. Well, you can't find God if you don't know there's a God to look for. There are people all over the world. There are people in the most remote parts of Africa and New Guinea, the most remote parts of the world, who believe there is a God. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? They have a sense in their spirit and in their heart, Martin, that there is a God. Now, those of us who are theologians, we believe that that is something God built into human nature. We believe God literally put within us a knowledge of Him. So to be an atheist, you have got to choose to believe that there is no God. Because it is human nature to believe that God exists. You go back into any society on planet Earth. You start digging you know, in the woods of South America, and you start uncovering uh, certain civilizations, you are going to find representations of their faith. Am I telling the truth? You're going to find religion in every culture, Martin. Everywhere you go around the planet, doesn't matter how educated, doesn't matter how ignorant, doesn't matter how unlearned, doesn't matter what the color of the people's skin, you're going to find evidence of religious belief. Am I telling the truth? Say, well, brother, you sure are belaboring this point. You'll understand why in a moment. 
So there is two groups of people in the world. People who believe in God, however they define God, however they understand God. And then you have those who have no use for God. And they don't believe in God. And they're, they're unbelievers. They're non-believers. When Jesus Christ stood in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, and made the declaration, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He was addressing those two groups of people. He was addressing those, uh, Bill, who believed there was no God. He was addressing those who believed there was a God. He was addressing Jews who embraced the Jewish law, the law of Moses. He was addressing Romans who believed in any myriad of gods. Do you understand what I'm saying today? All those who were within the sound of his voice came from one of two positions. Either they believed there was some God somewhere, somehow, or they believed that God was a fiction and folly. Am I telling the truth today? Those are the two groups of people that he was addressing. He said, come unto me all ye that are weak and heavy laden. This is another passage of scripture. He said, come unto me all ye that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Matthew, he's quoted as saying, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You know, my great aunt Dorothy is in her 80s. And Aunt Dorothy has said to me many times, and I have to agree with her, she said, Chuck, I don't know how anybody in this world can go through life without God. I don't know how anybody can do it. It has to be hard. It has to be hard, Martin, because when everything is hopeless, I still have hope. <laughs> When the doctors are saying the worst, I still am clinging to the best. Hallelujah. Oh, there is something in me that is different than in the heart and in the mind and in the life of the unbeliever. They can say I'm deluded all they want to, but that delusion has brought me from my deathbed and put me where I'm standing today in front of you. Amen. Hallelujah. My faith has delivered for me more times than I can count. Whoo, it's delivered when I was hungry. It's delivered when I was broke. It's delivered. It's delivered when I had bills to pay and no money to pay them. Woo! My faith has given me cars when I didn't have a nickel in the world to buy a car. My faith has provided me clothes when I had no resources to get clothes. My God have mercy. I don't know how anybody can live life without God. This is a pretty miserable world, folks. Man, if and, and I'm not going to go into the politics, I promise. I promise. I, I don't believe me. You have no idea. It, it bugs me as much as it bugs you. It really does. I, if I never had to say a word about it, I'd be thrilled out of my mind. I, <sighs> if we ever have realized what an evil, ungodly, hideous world we live in, we're seeing it now. Amen. We're seeing human beings treated like cattle. Folks, I thought that ended in 1945. I thought we would never see this again. In this, in this world. I, I thought for sure humanity had risen above inhumanity to humanity. I thought for certain we had come to a place. I thought America was a place that believed in a higher ideal. I thought we embraced compassion where other nations embraced law where other nations embraced the letter, where other nations embraced 
regulations, I thought we embraced compassion. My mistake. Mm -hmm. I thought America was a place where people could come and even if they tried to enter our country illegally, they would still be treated humanely and compassionately. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. That's not what we're seeing. And it breaks my heart. I never dreamed America would be a country where people would come. They don't come, I don't care what Donald Trump says, they're not coming to rape and pillage. They're not coming to steal us blind. They're coming to work hard and build a life and share in the dream that is America. That's what they're coming to do. You can twist it, pervert it, and what makes me doubly sick is that Christians are doing this. Perverting and twisting. Every Sunday before church, I go to a little diner down here on Buckner. It's owned by a Hispanic man, a Mexican man and his wife. They, you, he used to work for the kettle. You remember when the kettle was over here on 30, right here near the church, where the uh, uh, Waffle House is now? He used to work at the Waffle House as a cook. And Tommy and I went there for years when it was the Waffle House. We, oh, we used to love it. It was quite a nice place to eat, you know, good food. Pretty simple place, but good food. Reasonably priced. Well, the owner of the place decided he wanted out. And he decided he was going to close up shop. Well, that was going to put people out of work. That was going to cause a lot of trouble for folks. And Jose made an arrangement with him to buy the restaurant from him. But he couldn't afford all the uh, fees to franchise, so he made an arrangement with Waffle House that he would continue to, to buy his food from them, you know, wholesale, uh, but that he would take Waffle House off the sign, you know, and he changed the name to J.P.'s Cafe. It's Jose and Paula, he and his wife, J.P.'s Cafe. That man now, for what will be about four or five years, I guess, has been working his backside off. He and his family are the only people that run that place. The only people that work there. They open at like six in the morning. He's there at five. They close at three in the afternoon. He can't stay open any later because poor guy, you know, you can only put so many hours in a day. Close at 3 in the afternoon. I go there every Sunday. I created a website for him just to try to help him with his business. and didn't charge me anything. Just created it to be a... See, I'm, I'm an American. I believe when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. I believe it don't matter whether you speak Spanish, you speak Japanese, you speak... Uh, uh, French or use what language you speak that if you're part of this America you're part of the fabric that makes up the red white and blue that's how I believe and if I can help anybody in this country succeed I'm going to do it Bill I don't whatever I can do whatever little way I can contribute well another little way I try to contribute to JP's every Sunday I got to eat and most of you know I'm allergic to going into the kitchen it doesn't have anything to do with liking to, to make a uh, liking to buy out. Believe me, I, I love to cook and I love to, uh, you know, I, I, I've been a chef my whole life. I love to cook. I hate to clean. <laughs> and the time factor. A lot of times I just don't have time. So on Sunday afternoon before church, I go to JP's and I buy my lunch. Every Sunday I go there specifically for one reason. Because I'm in love with his bacon cheeseburger, partly. Partly. But honestly, and Tommy will tell you, my number one reason is I want to help him. I want to help him. Now, my contribution, going there every week for four weeks, five weeks a month, comes out to about probably $60 to $75 a month. But you know what? You let somebody start coming to this church giving 60 or $75 a month, see if it don't make a difference. Yep. Mm -hmm. It works for me. I know how important every little bit helps. You, you understand what I'm saying? 
I know how important it is. We live in a miserable world, folks. If human beings were left to their own devices, we would torment and torture and subjugate one another until only the cream of the crop survived. The rich want to get richer and they couldn't care less about the well-being of the poor. The strong want to get stronger and they could care less about the weaker. Without God, there is no love. Without God, there is no compassion. Without God, there is no humanity. It is God who taught us to be good to one another. It is God who teaches us to love one another. It is God who teaches us to have compassion on one another and to help one another. Oh my God, what is wrong with the Attorney General of the United States telling us that the Bible supports tearing children out of their parents' arms and sending them off to segregated camps? My God, I'll tell you something, you ignorant pile of Republicans. I'm going to tell you all something. You go to your Bible and you see what it says about how God expected his people to treat, quote unquote, strangers. Everywhere you read the word in the Old Testament, stranger, it literally means an immigrant. It means someone who comes into your country who is not from your country. And I'm going to tell you, to see, you can, Mr. Uh, Sessions, you can tear the Bible to shreds to try to make it say what you want it to say. But first of all, fool, listen to me. What Paul was writing was instruction to believers, to Christians, on how they were to conduct themselves. He was not instructing those who applied the law. He was instructing those who were under the law. And I got further news for you. He was not talking about government. He was talking about law enforcement. There's a difference. He said if a cop stops you, then you Cooperate with that police officer. You do what you're supposed to do. You do what he tells you to do. Because there's a reason he carries a sword. Or in modern times, he, that he carries a gun. Okay? He was not talking about government. He's talking about law enforcement. But if you want to tear scripture, but baby, you ain't going to do it on this preacher's time. I'm going to call your bluff. I'm going to call your bluff. No, the word of God says concerning strangers, mind you, Israel is the only country in the world that had a government that was designed by God. It's the only country in the world that has a government designed by God himself. And God said, Johnny, that the stranger was to be treated no differently than those who were born there. God said you were to treat a stranger as though he were one of your own. How do you like them apples? Amen. Mm, 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 mm. God said that, folks. When God designed a government, he designed a government that was compassionate, that was welcoming, that was uh, hospitable to all strangers, to all immigrants, to all people who came within the boundaries of the nation that was designated the people of God. So don't you dare twist the Bible out of shape and try to misquote the word of God. You want to tick this preacher off, you just try to twist scripture to make it say what you want it to say. All that does, Martin, in my eyes, is reveal what a lying scumbag devil Mr. Sessions is. That's all it does for me. Demonstrates what a lying sack of devil he is. Because anybody who loves the truth will never be careless with the word of God and will certainly never try to put words in God's mouth. There are two kinds of people in the world, believers and non-believers. 
Those who don't believe in God at all go through life with a great burden of believing that this life and this world is all we have. If we experience good, well, it's going to end when we die. If we experience bad, we have nothing better to look forward to. The burden of life without God, without faith in God, is great. The driving force in an unbeliever's life tends to be to obtain, to collect, to experience, and to consume. This life is our only reality according to the unbeliever. So we must cling to it and preserve it at all costs. Oh, but then there's this other group of folk. We call them believers. For the believer, there is hope of a brighter tomorrow. We have confidence that even in the worst of days here on planet Earth, we have a help and we have a hope that is found in our relationship with God. For the believer, there is also a burden that is inflicted upon them as people of faith. And that burden is found in the form of religion. Christ has provided relief from the burden of sin and unbelief. All sin is unbelief according to the word of God. Not only has Christ provided relief from the burden of sin, but listen to me now. He's also provided relief from the burden of religion. You see, men love to take advantage of that built-in sense that we have that there is a God. So you, you, think, you think the devil quits at the door of the church? You think Satan stays out, outside the door of the church? Say, oh no, that's hallowed ground. I can't go there. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Honey, he's as busy, if not busier, inside the church than he is outside the church. Amen. Believe me when I tell you. But you see, the reality is, when Jesus spoke and said, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He said, all of you who are unbelievers and all of those who labor under the burden of religion. Because mm. the enemy loves to take advantage of the fact that most people have some sense there is a God. And they try to seek out a way to connect with that God. They try to seek out a way to establish a relationship with that God. They try to find a way to please that God and to satisfy that God. And guess what? You've got religions lined up on either side of the door saying, oh, come this way, we'll help you find him. Come this way, we'll help you find him. Come this way, we'll help you find him. Oh, if you come our way, we'll help you find God. And there's Jesus at the other end saying, Come unto me. You see, if you ever, want to, you ever want to know what a cult is, I'll tell you what a cult is. A cult is any religion, any denomination, any organization that tells you, come unto me. See, the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that if you don't want to get wiped out at Armageddon, you better come be with us. The Mormons will tell you, oh, if you don't want to wind up in hell, if you don't want to wind up separated from God, you got to come be part of us. Now, I'm not saying they're saying you got to believe the way we believe. No, no, no. I don't care. I love when people say, well, I, I've read uh, Mormon people who have written, well, even fundamentalist Christians say that theirs is the only right way. I said, uh-huh, they sure do. They say ours is the only right way to believe. But they don't say our denomination is the only denomination you can belong to to be saved. There's a difference. But these cults love to play those little games. No, the Mormons don't say you've got to believe what we teach. No, the Mormons say you have got to be in our organization to be saved. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach 
Not that you have to believe their message. No, you have to be in their organization to be saved. Do you follow what I'm telling you? There's a world of difference, folks. I got news for you, folks. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that you must be in the Roman Catholic Church to be saved. Don't kid yourself. That is their dogma. They have taught it for millennium. And they have not backed down from it one iota. That is still their belief. You go to, you go to YouTube. And you will find all kinds of videos on YouTube produced by Catholic organizations that will let you know that if you're not in the Catholic Church, you are lost and you are bound for hell and there is no hope for you. They may hug up to the Protestants. They may kiss on the Protestants. They may hold picket signs at the abortion clinics with the Protestants. But the official position of Rome is if you don't belong to our organization, you are lost. That is the official position of Rome. Well, gee, that's funny. That puts it in the same company as cults, doesn't it? It's a little scary, isn't it? Religion is a burden. When Jesus was speaking in Matthew 11 to the audience to whom he was speaking, he was not speaking to an audience of unbelievers. No, he was not speaking merely to a bunch of people who had no concept of God, who had no knowledge of God. No, he was talking to those people, but he was also talking to the scribe and the Pharisee and the lawyer and the, the Jew, those who had a very firm belief in God, those who embraced a very firm and a very strict and a very specific belief system that we would otherwise describe as religion. And to both crowds, he was saying, Come to me! To me! Not to my church! Not to anybody representing me! No, my church will point you to me! Hallelujah! Here at Grace Oasis, the one church in Christ Jesus, we will always point you to Jesus. Hallelujah. You don't need us. You don't need me. You don't need this church. What you need is Jesus. Amen. He is the answer. He is the way to God. He is God manifest in human form. Our job in this church is not to establish ourselves as something unique and special so people think if they have any hope of heaven they have to belong to our number. No. Our job is to point people to Jesus. If people come to this church, and we've had many, we've had many who have come and I hate to say it, but a lot of folks have come who are non-LGBT. And they had a difficult time with the LGBT issue. You might remember we had that lovely fella and his wife and their little girl that came for quite a while. They drove all the way from Waco, Texas. And they came for months. But finally, before it was all said and done, he was overcome by the LGBT issue, you know, he had always been taught it's evil, it's wicked, it's horrible, it's wrong, you know, so on and so forth. And he could not overcome that. And that's why they stopped coming. Thank you, religion. Because after all, we were pointing them to our church, weren't we? We were trying to get them to believe on Pastor Charles, wouldn't I? No. No. Every word they heard off our pulpit pointed them to Jesus. Every word they heard taught in this church pointed them to Jesus. Am I telling the truth? Amen. So you see, uh, this church is doing a better job of pointing people to Jesus than most churches are today. There are too many of them now who have become just as tribal as the political parties. 
Too many churches today have become just as convinced that their way and their beliefs and their denomination and their organization is the answer. No, honey. No. In 1 AD, Jesus was the answer. On resurrection morning, Jesus was the answer. I got news for you. 2,000 some odd years later, he's still the answer. It still hadn't changed. Hallelujah to God. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, the church is the vehicle God uses to accomplish his task of evangelism and reaching an unsaved world. But the church is not the message. It is the vehicle vehicle by which the message is carried. Hallelujah. The double burden bearer. Are you under a burden today that has been placed upon you by religion? Are you under a burden? Do you find living for God to be as hard or harder than it was not living for Him at all? Because if you do, something's wrong. Something is desperately, desperately wrong. Somewhere along the line, if you will investigate it, if you will look carefully, you'll find that you're following the wrong leader. You're following the pastor. You're following the TV preacher. You're following the denomination. Oh, if I have a nickel... Good Lord, when I was 12 years old, I'll never forget this as long as I live. I used to, my parents' house, bless their heart, it was not a peaceful place. <laughs> and many of you know what I'm talking about. You've had similar experiences. It was not a peaceful place. When I was about 13, my father finally, finally, finally agreed to let me have my own bedroom. So I was 13 uh, living with my brother Michael, sharing a bedroom with my brother Michael, before my father finally let me have my own bedroom. We had plenty of bedrooms. I you know, could have done it much sooner, but he, you know, he didn't care about us having nothing. He just, you know, it was, it was a mess. When I was 13, I got my own bedroom. Oh my God, my world opened up because now I had privacy. Now I had a little place, a little corner of the world where I could find a, a little bit of peace, a little bit of quiet, a little bit, you know, get away from everybody else. I'd go to that room and I'd study my Bible and I'd pray, oh my God, God had called me to preach and I wanted to be ready to preach. I wanted to be qualified to preach. So I studied Brother Martin. I studied that book. I didn't just read it. I studied it. I studied. Believe me, I, I bought commentaries. I bought Bible encyclopedias. I bought Bible dictionaries and atlases and every, you know, every, I used to go to the Christian bookstore and to me that was like going to a college bookstore. You know, I'd just buy all these wonderful materials that I could learn from. I'd go into that room and I'd pray and one day the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me just clear as a bell and He said to me, do you know what you're going to preach? Maybe 13, 14, somewhere around there, maybe. I said, Lord, of course, of course I know what I'm going to preach. Hallelujah. Oh, man, I was all gung-ho. I, I, I had that answer in my holster ready to pull out the minute he asked, you know. Yeah, Lord, I know what I'm going to preach. I said, I've been born and raised in the assemblies of God my whole life. That was my answer. I know what I'm going to preach. Why? Because I've been in the assemblies of God my whole life. Do you know what he said to me? No, you don't. That's all he said. No, you don't. I stood there, Johnny. I was like, what, deer in the headlights. What are you talking about, Lord? What do you mean? How can you tell me I don't know what I'm going to preach? How can you tell me I don't know what? Why, 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 why I've been born in this movement. I was born and raised in this church. I know everything there is to know about Assemblies of God doctrine. Bless God. I can quote it backside forward, upside down. I can give you every argument in the universe for the Trinity. I can give you every argument in the universe for why baptism doesn't have nothing to do with salvation. I can give you every argument in the universe for this, that, and the other thing. 
And the Lord's telling me I had no idea what I was going to preach. Little did I know that I one day would find my way into the one God, Jesus' name, Acts 2.38, Jesus' name, baptized in movement. Hallelujah. <laughs> little did I know. Little did I know I would one day <laughs> be brought into a ministry that was designed to minister to everyone, including LGBT people, and help them understand that God's grace works for them just as well and just as flawlessly as it works for anybody. Amen. Little did I know, Johnny. See, God knew. I had a lot of miles yet to go. I, I didn't have a clue where I was headed, but God knew where I was headed. But you know one thing I'm glad for? It doesn't matter whether I was in the Assemblies of God at 12 years old as a youth evangelist doing children's crusades and vacation Bible schools and what have you as Jiggle the Clown, I was still preaching Jesus. Never in my journey have I ever tried to preach people to my feet, but I've always tried to preach them to the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. If there's anything that makes me happy, it's seeing somebody find their way to Jesus because He's the one who said, Come unto me. Come unto me. You want rest from living a life without God? You want rest from the struggle of believing that all we have is what we have now? You want rest from believing that this miserable, evil world where human beings will take advantage of one another and abuse one another and mistreat one another? If you want rest from believing that that's all there is, Come unto me, Jesus said. You want rest from a system of rules and regulations. You want rest from a law that is ungiving. You want rest from dogma that is without flexibility. Jesus said, come unto me. See, it's not just the burden of the sinner that Jesus offers to carry. But it's the burden of the religious as well. Hallelujah. Because, honey, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people today that are in religion that aren't saved. As long as you're carrying that religious burden around with you, sweetheart, you're not walking in fellowship with Jesus. Because when you walk with Jesus, He's the one that does the carrying, not you. Isn't that what He said? My Lord, have mercy. He said, my yoke is easy. What's a yoke? A yoke is a wooden fixture that is used to bring two or more animals together so that they can pull a plow or they can pull a wagon or a cart of some sort. The Lord said, my yoke is easy. You know why? Because I'm the stronger of the two. You get yoked up with me, honey. I'm going to do most of the work. You're not going to have to do much at all. Hallelujah. You get yoked up with me, and you're just going to be able to go along for the ride because I'm the one doing the pulling. <laughs> I'm the one who's putting in the muscle. I'm the one that's got the holiness. I'm the one that's got the righteousness. I'm the one that's got what you haven't got. Hallelujah. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Why is his yoke easy? Because he's the one doing all the work. All you got to do is keep up with him. <laughs> all you got to do is stay beside him and not fight him. Put two, put two animals in a yoke and see what happens if they're fighting each other. You ain't going nowhere. Don't matter how strong one of them is. <laughs> if that other one going to fight him the whole way, so when the Lord said, my yoke is easy, he's simply saying, yield to my will. Let me lead. Hallelujah. Let me guide you. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Word of God said, they are the sons of God. Whew. Martin, let him lead. Let him pull. Let him do the hard work. All you've got to do is stay in line with him. All you've got to do is yield to his will. If he said, let's go left, you go left. If he said, let's go right, then you go right. Hallelujah. If he said, let's go straight, you go straight. My Lord, have mercy. 
Isn't that exciting today? Amen. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, this thing, you know, I remember growing up in church. I'm going to tell you something. Christianity, for me, growing up in the fundamentalist church, growing up, uh, I believe salvation was entirely upon my shoulders. I believed if I was going to make heaven, Martin, it was all about what I could do and how I could do it. I believed that everything I said, everything I did, every wrong I committed had me in danger of hellfire. I went to church most Sundays, and I'm telling you, I don't care how old, how cold the air conditioner was, I was feeling the fire of hell on my feet. Hello now. Because the pastor just loved to stick a knife through me and then hang me over the fire like I was a hot dog in a camp out. That's what preachers think their job is. That's what they think they're supposed to do. See, I'm supposed to help you make heaven by scaring the hell out of you. Pardon the pun. No. No, I'm supposed to help you make heaven by helping you find Jesus. I'm supposed to help you make heaven by helping you connect with Him. I'm supposed to help you make heaven by helping you understand that the only way you're going to get there is to let Him lead. Let Him lead. Don't try to lead. Let Him lead. Hallelujah. He'll get you where you're going. Oh, I'm going to tell you, Jesus will get you where you're going. He's got the strength. I'm so glad. We used to sing those, I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free, set me free from unbelief. But he also set me free from religion. Hallelujah. Now I'm focused solely on him. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you can find all the faults you want to with affirming theology. You can find all the faults you want to with this church. You can preach this preacher into hell all you want to. I don't preach unbelief. I don't preach religion. I preach Jesus. Hallelujah. So you find all the faults you want to. But I've got a thought. When it comes to judgment day, I bet you Jesus sees things differently than you do. Right. I'll bet you down to Adona Martin, he's not looking at us the way they are. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 10. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Now listen, verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. You want to know what religion's all about? Religion's all about hypocrisy. It's all about preaching one thing to you and doing something else for me. Hello now. Oh, I'm going to tell you. I love all these fundamentalists and evangelical Christians who are such big supporters of certain political figures today. I just love them. Why, bless God, they were saying the identical same things about uh, Bill Clinton 25 years ago that they're saying about Donald Trump today, weren't they? What, are you kidding? Are you kidding? I remember... The thought of a divorced man trying to run for president was questionable. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember when old Ronald Reagan, one of the most popular presidents in this century, you remember when old Ronald Reagan was trying to run for president, everybody was questioning whether or not he could be president. Why? Because he'd been divorced. Right. He had old Jane Wyman off in the shadows. Am I telling the truth? Oh my God, yes. 
Oh, yeah, Bill Clinton has a little fling with one of the young pretties at the White House. And oh, my God, well, that's the most immoral, ungodly, hideous thing we can do. But we got a guy running for president who's on record saying, well, I'm a celebrity. I can just walk up to anybody and knock any woman I want and grab her by the private parts and I can kiss on her and I can do what I want to do and I can get away with it because I'm a star. All of a sudden, why well, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, that's that's just you know locker room talk. <laughs> Hypocrisy, folks, is an earmark of religion. It's funny how they preach one thing when it's a Democrat. Oh my God! Yep. But all you have to do is have a D behind somebody's name, and the rules change. Have an R behind their name, and all of a sudden everything's good. Everything's fine. There ain't no problem with nothing. Why, we'll, we'll support Lucifer Beelzebub himself for president so long as he runs as a Republican. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. That's another trademark of religion. It's about what men see. It's about what people see. You're not focusing on what God's looking at. You're focusing on what people are looking at. Bless God, we're supposed to be separate from the world. We're supposed to look separate from the world. When the world looks at us, they're supposed to see. What are they supposed to see? I'm not talking to you Lutheran background. I'm not talking to you Methodist background. I'm, not talk I'm talking to the Pentecostal background folk. Oh, oh, they're supposed to see hair piled on a lady's head a mile high. They're supposed to see dresses down to the floor. They're supposed to be sleeves down to their fingertips. Hallelujah. No jewelry, no makeup. Because the world is supposed to... Uh, excuse me, what? 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 I thought holiness was about what... God sees, not what the world sees. Well, I got news for you. My Bible said man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. That's why Brother Gilliam told me years ago, he said, Chuck, don't preach clothesline because getting people to change the way they dress is easy. Getting people to change the way they think and the way they act and the way they feel, he said, that's a whole different ballgame. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to make Christians out of people, if you're going to help them live for God, you've got to help them find a change of heart, not a change of clothing. Amen. You can put any old devil, any child molester, in a black shirt and a white backward collar, and people will assume he is, quote, holy. You, you put any old pig, any, any person you want to in an outfit like that, and when people look at them, they assume they're supposed to be a wholesome, decent, godly person. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. You assume they're a man or woman of God. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. See, dress appearance, attire. And they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Oh, they love to be recognized by people. They love people to give them special treatment. I attended a wedding. I was pastor in my first church and a young couple who uh, were part of my church from the very first Sunday, Frankie and Suzanne. They had already made arrangements to get married before uh, they started coming to my first church, and they were there for the first service, and they apologized to me profusely and said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. We love you so much. We'd love for you to do our wedding, but we already made arrangements for Brother Dan Mariano to do it at the Assembly of God in Danbury, Connecticut. Now, I knew Dan Mariano for years. He's a good man, wonderful man. And I said, you know what? Don't you worry about it. It don't bother me none. I don't have to do your wedding, you know. You know, why, why do people get caught up in all? See, but religious folk, they're all about appearances. They're all about, oh, no, no, no. I love to be the top dog. I love to be the one everybody comes to. I love him. I said, don't worry about it. They said, well, we want you to participate in our wedding somehow, some way. I said, it's not necessary. 
Don't worry about it. Just have your wedding. Let's have a good time. I'll be there as a guest all as well. I went to the wedding, and I sat a little spot toward the back. They, somebody come to me and say, oh, no, no, Pastor, they want you to sit up front. They want you to sit up, you know. Well, you know what? I know preachers that are headed right from the front from the get-go. They'd have walked in there and go, I'm their pastor, bless God. I'm going to sit right there in front because after all, I'm their pastor. Do you know what I'm talking about? We got a church world today who don't even know what humility is anymore. The Bible said, Jesus said, they love the uppermost, uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. And as pastor in my first church, we had a radio program. I can't tell if Martin's looking at his nails or his watch, but either way, I'm on top of it. <laughs> I was pastoring my first church. We had a radio program in the valley where I was pastoring in Connecticut. And I'd go into the shopping mall in Ansonia. And uh, I'd walk into that shopping plaza. We had a big indoor mall, you know, kind of like Mesquite Mall there at Town East. And I'd walk in by the uh, food court. That's where I usually would enter. You know me, I have a love affair with food. <laughs> and I'd walk in that building. All of a sudden, I'd be hearing... Hello, Pastor, how are you? I'm 19 years old, mind you. Hello, Pastor, how are you? Uh, hi, Pastor, and I'm hearing people. I'm looking around. Uh, oh, how are you? Hi. Uh, how are you? I feel like a celebrity. It's like, good Lord. I had eight or ten people, literally, every time I walked in. Hello, Pastor, hi, how are you? I, I don't even know who these people are. So after the first couple of times that happened, I began to walk over to the people and say, well, how are you, you know? And uh, uh, do I know you? Because, you know, for some reason I don't recognize your face. Oh, no, no, I listen to your program every Sunday. Listen to you on the radio. You know there are people, Martin, who get on the radio for no other reason than they love that. That's not why I was on the radio. That's, that, was, that was not why I was on the radio. But see, religion loves people to recognize you. Religion loves, oh, why that person is so special. Have you ever known somebody who just carries themselves in such a way that everybody says, oh, why that brother so and so, why he's just the sweetest, dearest person. Got news for you, he can stab you in the back quicker than anybody in the room. And you don't even know it. You don't know what that person's capable of. But, they put on a good show because that's religion. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Let's go to John so I can finish chapter 8, verse 31 through 36. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. Well, gee, you forgot all about 400 years in Egypt, apparently. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever. But the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What was Jesus saying? He was saying, when you come to me, 
when you come into relationship with me, when you establish yourself with me, I set you free. I emancipate you. You are no longer a servant. You see, religion makes you a servant. The Son sets you free. Hallelujah. The Son gives you rest. You're not a servant, but you are emancipated. You are set free by the truth, and the truth is in Jesus alone. Nothing else, no, no denomination, no organization, no religion has the key. Jesus is the key. Hallelujah. He's the double burn bearer. Are you under...